Good morning. Today we're looking at Luke chapter 8, verses 4 to 21. And this has to do with a, a very important concept <clears throat> of hearing and listening and acting. Hearing is through the ears, but listening is through the mind. Both use the ears, but it's one thing to hear, and it is quite a different thing to listen. And to listen and to respond is an even more important concept. To hear is to obey, is the concept that is in the Old Testament. When Samuel, as a child, heard God speaking to him, he said, I hear and I will obey. Merriam-Webster defines hearing as the process or function or power of perceiving sounds, specifically the special sense by which noises and tones are received as stimuli. Listening, on the other hand, means to pay attention to sound, to hear something with thoughtful attention, and to give consideration. A clinical psychologist says the difference between the two is like night and day. Hearing is like collecting data, he explains. The act of hearing is rather simple and basic. Listening, on the other hand, is a three-dimensional concept. People that excel at work or in marriage or in friendships are the ones who have honed in the ability to listen. Hearing does not require focus, whereas listening does. See, somehow God is involved in the listening process we are seeing here in Luke. Jesus talks about listening not merely as a mental function, but as a spiritual function. And Jesus is teaching in parables. Some of you remember the Greek word for the comforter, the paraclete, the one who will come alongside. That's what para means. And a parable is to put one thing alongside another as a comparison. Parables are common rhetorical devices employed by rabbis through the centuries. Jesus puts down a story alongside a spiritual truth to make the truth more clearly understood. They could be belief or brief illustrations, but they could also be extended analogies, like the one we're looking at today. Parables profa place profound truth in a simple setting, making it vivid and interesting and unforgettable. And that's what we're looking at here in this parable, hearing and responding. God's word is proclaimed, and there are different levels of response, ranging from those who take no notice to those whose lives are completely transformed. Why? Two different people hear the gospel. One hears and it has no impact at all. 
and another is completely transformed for a lifetime. The parable of the sower explains some of these reasons why people do not respond. And there are some who God's word becomes abundantly successful, multiplying, having a crop. Not everyone, this passage is, tells us, is privileged to understand the secrets of the kingdom of God. Everyone can listen, but not everyone is able to respond. The truth is meant to be revealed, but not hidden. And those who hear the word of God and put it into practice are Jesus' true family. Luke chapter 8, verses 4, following. One day Jesus told a story in the form of a parable to a large crowd that had gathered from many towns to hear him. A farmer went out to plant his seed. As he scattered it across his field, some seed fell on the footpath where it was stepped on, and the birds ate it. Other seed fell among the rocks. It began to grow, but the plant soon wilted and died for the lack of moisture. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up with it and choked out the tender plants. Still other seed fell on the fertile soil. This seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as had been planted. When he had said this, he called out, Anyone! with ears to hear, should listen and understand. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He replied, You are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of God, but the use of parables to teach the others so that the scripture might be fulfilled. When they look, they won't really see. When they hear, they won't really understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only to have the devil come and take it away from their hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. The seeds on the rocky soil represent those who hear the message and receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they believe for a while. Then they fall away when they face temptation. The seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. And they never grow into maturity. And the seeds that fell on the good soil represent honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. He goes on, No one lights a lamp, then covers it with a bowl, or hides it under a bed. A lamp is placed on a stand where the light can be seen by all who enter the house, for all that is secret will eventually be brought into the open, and everything that is concealed will be brought to the light and made known to all. So pay attention to how you hear, to those who listen to my teachings. More understanding will be given but for those who are not listening, even what they think they understand will be taken away from them. Then Jesus' mother and brother 
brothers came to see him, but they couldn't get in because of the crowd. Someone told Jesus, your mother and your brothers are standing outside and they want to see you. And Jesus replied, my mother and my brothers are all those who hear the word of God and obey it. See, Jesus is continuing to preach. And people from various cities are journeying there to hear him. A large crowd has gathered. And he speaks this parable of the sower. He is proclaiming the word of God. He is scattering the seed. This same parable is in Mark 4 and in Matthew 13. But here it's briefer. And the focus is on not everybody hears and understands. He is talking and focusing on hearing and acting on it. He's talking to a peop group of people who are involved in agriculture. They are scattering seed. And in the ancient world, paths and, and roads were right in the middle of a field, so seed would naturally fall everywhere, on the rocks and on the path, and everyone knew what he was talking about. It made complete sense because that's how they see was uh, broadcast. It was thrown into the air. It was scattered. They didn't have elaborate machinery. It would fall everywhere. And he's pointing to Isaiah, and the mission that Isaiah had, and the people were unresponsive as they were in the early church. There was widespread rejection of what Isaiah preached and what the Jews were hearing in the first century. We see this in Acts 28, 24 to 28. Some fell along the path. Some fell on rocky ground. It came up and yielded a crop on good soil more than a hundred times that was sown. He's a hundredfold as a yield of a very good crop. Not of the realm of fantasy, but according to a Jewish writer, it's a sign of God's ultimate blessing, a miraculous 1,500 fold yield. So a hundred fold is, is normal. And he's telling us that the gospel is not understood by everyone. There is a theme throughout scripture about the secrets, that there is a mystery to the revelation of God. We see this in the book of Daniel, where God's truths are hidden from other people and are revealed to his faithful servant, Daniel. And Jesus is revealing these mysterious secrets to his disciples. They're in a privileged position. It's not hidden like it is to the others. Not because they are clever, but because they, like Daniel, are given special insight by God himself in Christ his way of salvation is not a matter of natural insight, but of special revelation. To others, I speak in parables. 
And this is the meaning of the parable. See, spiritual insight is the dimension that Jesus is talking about here in hearing and understanding and acting upon what you hear. It takes something spiritual to make it happen. This spiritual insight is given by God through his Holy Spirit. Jesus said, For no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me, and at the last day I will raise them up. Jesus also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. The seed is the word of God. There is no church. There is no Christian anything without the proclamation of the word of God. It is essential. And the seed that transforms, the power of the gospel that transforms is the seed. And in Luke, I mean, Isaiah 6, 9, it says, Listen carefully, but do not understand. Watch closely, but learn nothing. Harden the hearts of these people. Plug their ears and shout their eyes, that they may will see and not see with their eyes, nor hear with their ears, nor understand with their hearts, and turn to me for healing. See, God is the one who opens people's hearts and minds to receive the gospel. We can pray, we can preach, but it's only what God decides to do. We're not in control. You can't save anybody. This nonsense that I saved somebody. No, it's the word of God that transforms people, and they can only be transformed if God draws them to himself. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. And no one lights a lamp and hides it. Be a light. Expose the truth is what he's telling his disciples to do. Be a light. You don't put a light under, underneath a basket. You put it on a stand so it shines forth. No one lights a lamp and then covers it with a bowl or hides it under a bed. A lamp is placed on a stand where its light can be seen by all who enter the house. For all that is secret will eventually be brought into the open, and everything that is concealed will be brought to light and made known. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed. Whoever has will be given more. But if you're not really listening, what they think they have will be taken from them. Those are harsh words. You can play Christianity but it's only because of the spirit working in your heart to change your heart that any of us have any hope of change and salvation. And Jesus loves his mother and he loves his brothers. But he's saying to those who have faith and respond and hear and act on the word of God, my mother and brother are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. 
you can be part of Jesus's family. When we act consistently by faith because of the Holy Spirit working in our lives to guide us and draw us close to God. In the book by Dostoevsky, the brothers Karmanazov, it was Dostoevsky's last book. It was written in 1880. He died in 1881. And the attitudes of the brothers and the father in this novel parallel the hearers of this parable. The catalyst of this family is the youngest son, Alyosha, the believing youngest son, a winsome character who has communicated and lives the truth out to his family. The father is a buffoon who pays little attention to his sons. His oldest son, Dmitri, is a sensualist, much like his father, but also very close to his brother, Alyosha. The second son, Ivan, is a profound thinker And he's, his view that God is not intervening in life for the suffering children has made him an agnostic. See, it's the one who lives out the truth, Ayosha, the youngest son, who communicates and lives out the truth with his family is the one who is special. And that's our job in life, to live out the truth. Not only to hear it, but to put it into practice. See, the good news of salvation is wonderful. It's glorious. It's magnificent. The blessing of forgiveness of sin, the freedom from its tyranny, Justification being made right with God. Eternal life, peace with God, adoption into his family is what Jesus is talking about. We can be adopted into the family of God. Paul talks about this in Romans 8, 15. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the filling, the empowering of the Holy Spirit, having a clear conscience the hope of heaven in the face of life and death, to have the mind of Christ that's revealed by the word of truth. This parable that we just looked at is about redemption. It's a simple illustration that provides those who hear unforgettable insight into the subject of being receptive to the gospel. The issue is not the gospel message, nor is it the skill or the methodology of those proclaiming it. The determining factor, you don't have to hear Billy Graham to become a Christian. The determining factor is the condition of the hearer heart. It's the soil. It's the dirt. What kind of dirt are you? Are you good soil? Are you rocky? Are you packed and impervious to life? Solomon said, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. Proverbs 4.23. The mouth, according to Jesus, speaks out that which fills the heart. Matthew 12.34. 
the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, slanders. Scripture describes such a heart as wicked, desperately sick, perverse, insane, unclean, deceitful, disloyal, errant, unrepentant, unbelieving, blind, deceived, rebellious, stubborn, and dull. All of these negative terms expose the depths of human depravity. But when the heart hears the word of God and responds with trust because the Holy Spirit is working in their life. In the 1800s, there was a businessman who came, became a, eventually a Presbyterian minister. His name was John Samus. And he lived from 1846 to 1919. And he wrote over a hundred hymns. In 19, excuse me, 1887, a young man stood up to speak after a meeting with Dwight Dave L. Movey. And he'd preached. And this man got up and he was obviously not conversant with the Bible teachings and doctrines. He nevertheless moved the audience when he said at the end of his testimony, but I am going to trust. I'm going to obey Daniel B. Towner, a music composer in the audience, was struck by the young man's words and gave them to Samus, who developed him into a hymn text. This hymn became a great favorite and is still beloved in many circles. The well-known refrain is trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. And here are some of the other verses. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay for the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. See, even the ability to trust and obey is a response that God gives you in your heart. Once you hear the word of God, to trust him and obey him. And God will fill you with his Holy Spirit to give you the power and the strength to continue to walk in trust and obedience. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you have worked in our lives. Your sovereign plan, we don't understand it, how it works in one life and not in another. We can come with theological explanations, but we don't know. We know that you're in charge and yet your will is perfect. And Lord, for those of us who hear and respond, may we live with trust and obedience. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.